Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets, and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. From the outside, it looks like an average family home, but this home has some unusual residents. These are our two baby sloths. They're zoo animals, and they're gonna go into exhibits in the zoo, but chances are, since my wife raised them, they're probably gonna have to come home every night now because they're a little more than just a zoo animal. In 1994, Charlie Samet bought 51 acres of land in Salinas, California. It started as a small exotic animal rental business, supplying animals for film and television, with part of the property dedicated to an elephant sanctuary. It grew into Monterey Zoo, which is now home to more than 100 exotic zoo animals. Or maybe Charlie and his wife, Lisa, just have a lot of peculiar pets. We treat them, I guess, by definition, like pets. It's tough to say, I don't think people should have them as pets because we spend 24 hours a day with them. Because we're a zoo, we're able to do that. If we had to go to work every day and spend what little time we had left with them, I don't know that they could get the care they need to stay healthy. And they're so fragile. They can't walk on the ground. They have to hold you. They've got a cute little seal-like face, and you put all that together and people just adore them. They're needy. Uh, but although they're a little more aggressive than some might think. While the sloths are young, Charlie's schedule revolves completely around their care. So what's funny is your, your life revolves around them. If we're out somewhere, we have to get home because Bugsy and Belle have to get their exercise. So Lisa lets them run around the house at night. Um, and then we have to make their food and it has to be cut a certain way. Oh, baby. Oh, I know. Hmm. Now, how do you do this and convince somebody that it doesn't make a good pet? I get it. But I mean, yeah, look at that face. He's real bitey. Sometimes he just gets in these moods and Lisa will take him into the dining room. They like, at the bottom of our dining room chairs is their jungle gym. They chase each other all over. And uh, we'll go walking by and they'll just come crawling across the floor, lunging at us. It's like, I, don't, I think they're playing war. But yeah, when he's in a bad mood, he can be very bitey. Monterey Zoo is not an accredited zoo. And that's what allows them to treat their animals more like pets than zoo exhibits. We've chosen not to be accredited by the larger institutions, the larger clubs, if you will, because some of the rules they have prohibit us from giving the elephants the quality of life they need. I think we treat them like pets, but I think we treat the elephants like pets too, and I can't bring them home. Now, my home is on the zoo property. Is that what makes the difference? I, I don't know. Uh, some of my staff don't have homes on the zoo property, and I let them take some things home. Are they pets? How do you define it? They come right back to the zoo, and they have a purpose at the zoo. But we try to treat them all like pets. And the sloths 
aren't Charlie's most unusual zoo exhibit pets. Wife Lisa has forged a bond with a badger. It was raised here in the house with us. Had its personality and its temperament afforded it to do so, it would still be in the house with us. We love it to death. Unfortunately, it started plucking the tiles off the kitchen floor. So it was time to go to the zoo. But that was a decision it made. It just ended up that way. But we still go down there and put a leash on him and take him for his walk every day, like you would a pet. Given that Charlie's career working with animals started with his pet lion, Joseph, it's not surprising that Charlie blurs the line between zoo animals and pets. I had an African lion that was just uh, beyond the scope of reason. He was so safe, so patient, so unusual. My children could ride on his back. Yeah, he did things I wouldn't think of doing today. I can't imagine what I was thinking back then. Uh, but he could come home with me and sleep on the dining room floor. I mean, he was very, very special. A one in a million. It was only because of Joseph's extraordinary nature and willingness to perform that Charlie entered the entertainment industry and later started a zoo. He started this with me. So, I mean, was he a pet? It was much more of a relationship than a, some lion in a zoo with a keeper. I mean, we went to Africa together, we went to Germany together, we went to Mexico together, we've been in every state in the United States. But technically, we were a business. We were in the animal training and animal rental business for entertainment. Now, again, because I was in that business, I was with him the entire time, and so it created that kind of animal. So I will argue that if you're keeping them as a pet, but your business, your industry, isn't something that affords you the time to spend with them, there is no way to keep it safe. You have to stay with them, you have to be with them, you have to have a team of people that are helping you do it. Uh, you, it has to be a professional situation. But that's not to say there's not pet owners that don't work somewhere else. They don't work commercially, but they're with their animals 24 seven, that's what they do. They have the ability to do so and therefore end up with good animals. Most of the professionals in this business will tell you that some of the best animals they've ever gotten were pets that were confiscated from people because they got so much time and so much interaction that they were just wonderful animals. We have our, um, our regular pets, if you will. Okay, because I do tell people it's nice to come home and sit down on the couch with something that you know probably won't eat you. I, I know, I know, I know. This chicken was brought into a Los Angeles veterinarian to be euthanized. Because when it was born, its beak was like this. And the, the veterinary facility, the owner of the facility is a very good friend of mine. And she pointed out that day when I was visiting that if this chicken were a lion or a tiger, we wouldn't think about twice about doing surgeries and fixing it. But because it was a chicken, it's here to be euthanized. So long story short is she told me that she would fix the beak if I would adopt it for the zoo afterwards. And so um, three surgeries later with pins and bone marrow transplants and um, we fixed the chicken. And that's about as good as we got it but it can eat now. Before it had to have a stomach tube and it can drink. So this is, again, you know, we, we try to tell people there are unique pets that aren't necessarily lions and tigers. Uh, this happens to be a chicken. The chicken had the Monterey Zoo board divided. It came with controversy. You know, there was a lot of people on our board that said people don't come to zoos and pay to see chickens. You know, and our argument was it, it, that's not what it's about. Are, are we doing what we do because of what people want, or are we doing what we do because of what animals need? Never met who have. Charlie pet continues online. to blur the line in their relationship and zoo animals. Even the apex predators 
get treated like part of the family. You guys okay? Yeah. Put the line up and lock us up. Once again, we're struck by the rapport Charlie has with even the most dangerous animals. These bears may be young, but their claws and teeth could easily kill. Yet with Charlie, the experience feels completely safe. Over the years, Charlie has also worked with many big cats. and they all require a different approach. He credits leopards as being among the most dangerous. The problem with leopards is that you walk in with them and you're in trouble and you didn't know it. A lion or a tiger, they'll be on top of whatever they're possessive of, so you know it. It's a very explosive brain. It's a very different brain. Lions then have your social structure to deal with, so they've learned to fight each other. Many companies won't touch lions. Um, you can have the best lion cub in the world and he turns five, six years old and he tries, to, he challenges you for that position in the pride and it's all gone. I'd say tiger's about the easiest, believe it or not. Unfortunately, their teeth are the longest, so the bites are bad. But the way their brains work, their social structures, they're solitary. That's why in circuses you see more tigers in the ring than anything. Although the entertainment business enabled Charlie to be closer to wild animals than most people will ever get the chance to be, there are some things he doesn't miss about working with animal entertainers, like wrestling lions. That I'll never do again with a lion. Because mm -hmm. that goes from play to sport one day. And when it goes to sport, okay, you have an animal you've never met before right. on top of you. And it's a bad, bad day. So we were prepping for a movie once, for uh, one of Costner's movies, and it was an attack scene. And I did days of this lion coming up on top of me. And one day it turned to sport and I didn't see it. And he hunkered down on me and he bit me. He, he grabbed me right here. I ended up with two broken ribs and a punctured lung. Two people came at him in the CO2. He jumped on one, bit a hole through the CO2, a steel canister. And before I could get up and get away, he was on top of me again and he bit me again. So she had to go get a tractor and drive it over top of me to get the cat off of me. 20 minutes later, and we had him all in a fenced area, we were prepping, okay? Came back, his head seemed right again, opened the door, they got a leash on him and walked him to his cage, he was fine. They're, they're just, they, they are what they are and you know it going into it. Even those who have had extraordinary relationships with exotic animals know there's always an element of danger. I was with Ron Whitfield, a very prominent trainer here, and, and used to be a circus man, and he worked for Six Flags at the time. You know, I was doing the TV series Born Free, and I needed two lions to simulate a lion fight in the movie. So of course, what we look for is two male lions that were raised together that play. And we'll dub in the noises later and make it sound like it's a fight. Well, I went to see his two lions in his ring act and um, he brought them into the ring together and they were bouncing around playing with each other. But the play turned to sport and they got in a fight. And when the time it was done and it was over and he separated them, um, I think he's quite frankly, he's the bravest man I've ever seen in my life stay in that ring. I'd never seen anything like it. He did not leave that ring, and the noise, the cement was shaking. Oh, and I was standing outside the ring. You know, Ron, do you need any help? Nope, got it covered. Good. It was terrifying. But despite the danger, Charlie is still inclined to treat even the zoo's most predatory animals as pets. When I got him, when we started raising him, <laughs> We did like everything else. Hey, stop it. We did like everything else, and we tried to raise him as a pet. You know, we wanted him to have as much relationship as he possibly could. Um, and 
just didn't work out. Hey, what are you doing? Well, it's a difficult species. And his hair grows backwards. You don't know if they're a male or a female unless you truly blood test them. Nothing makes sense. They run as fast backwards as they do forwards. Their legs are longer in the front than they are in the back. They're born with teeth. They're born with their eyes open. Nothing is right um, by animal standards. To keep one friendly is a challenge, but it doesn't mean we didn't give it a chance. What's wrong? Why are you so angry today? Hmm? Why are you so angry? In the hyena's case, even Charlie admits that this is one predator that doesn't make a good pet. If you ask me how I feel if one of my neighbors were to come home one day and announce that they got a hyena as a pet, probably wouldn't be real fond of the idea. No two ways about it. I wouldn't want that next door. Charlie even has animals a lot of us have never heard of. This is a binturong, a bear cat. His name is Doc. Doc kind of has his own fan club. People who come get to play with him on one of our tours. They start Facebooking him. It's gotten ridiculous. He's just one of the coolest animals. Oh. Are you dangerous? Hmm? Are you dangerous? I know. You're so grumpy. You're so grumpy. Hmm? For some reason, Doc has been really nice. Um, he gets to visit with guests, he gets to play with them. Again, raised in the kitchen, you know, in a home, whether it was my home or sometimes he stayed in other people's homes and um, it created this. So if you go to any zoo and you ask for the animal that smells like buttered popcorn, they're gonna take you to a bear cat. Kisses. What? At Charlie's Zoo, even mountain lions, the largest cats in North America, become little more than house cats. She started off in our kitchen before the chicken. With the big cats, as soon as they're able to jump up on the counters, they become part on the house. When it comes to keeping exotic animals as pets, Charlie repeatedly recommends spending large amounts of time with the animals and the need to be a very dedicated pet owner. Training needs to start when the animals are young. Problems with your lions and tigers are, you kinda gotta be here when they're babies and you gotta stick with them when they're babies. You gotta pour a lot into them then if you're gonna have any kind of relationship when they're adults. So there is no safe way to introduce an adult lion or a tiger to someone new without risking that challenge and a train crash as a result of it. So it's, it's far more ideal to have them there when they're babies. Can it work out? Sure. Um, is it supposed to? Probably not. Because there's really no reason why that tiger shouldn't challenge you for that position. You know, anytime you work with a wild or an exotic animal, you're asking it to surrender instinct. The question is, how much instinct is it fair to ask an animal to surrender? That's the question. So even when we were working with circuses, we would suggest to them that it's the relationship between the tiger and the trainer that people are most fascinated with. Is jumping through the fiery hoop really necessary anymore? Because if you're up in the crowd and you listen to the crowd, okay, it's when the trainer walks up and hugs that lion and disappears in his mane, you hear all the oohs and the ahs. Entertaining moviegoers or zoo visitors, Charlie has no problem asking his animals to contribute to the running of the household. I don't feel bad for anything I ask my animals to do because I'm really not asking them to do anything I'm not doing also. You know, they have to stand there and take a picture with somebody to help us make ends meet. So do I. And it pays for our home and our food, and that's 
how the whole thing works, and we all participate, animals included. And I realize there are activists who would argue otherwise. The animals don't have a choice. And I would argue, not sure I do. And you do, you have to sleep at night. So how much instinct is it fair to ask them to surrender? Maybe as I get older, I'm surrendering more and more, you know? But when you have human kids, you find yourself doing that too. Once the zoo is closed for the day and all the visitors have gone, the staff begin the nighttime routine. For Charlie, that means quality time with the exhibits. Right now, everything goes to bed and I usually interrupt it along the way and play with it and the staff hates it because half of them want to go home, but it's too bad. And once you've raised chickens, sloths, and badgers in your kitchen, and realized your dream of opening a zoo, forming close bonds with all sorts of weird and wild animals, what do you do next? It's kind of a retirement for me. It's uh, open the gate in the morning, close the gate at night, and know that the, the animals got what I promised. You know, this was all about a promise to Joseph. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to see it, but we did promise him that day that we would finish it. That's all this is, one big promise. And, uh, and, it's, and it, I actually now feel like it's gonna happen. Hohenwald, Tennessee. Would you think that you would have elephants in Hohenwald, Tennessee? But you do. In her role as Mary Ann on Gilligan's Island, Don Wells was America's sweetheart. Today, with dozens of film, television, and theater credits, she now also devotes herself to more philanthropic pursuits. A strong animal advocate, Don is an ambassador for the Elephant Sanctuary in Hohenwald, Tennessee. My friend Lois Knight is one of the people on the board and, and started it, and she came to me and said, this is what we're doing. I'm curious and I love animals, so if there's an adventure that I haven't done, I'm trying. I mean, that's a pretty big adventure to try to find a place in Tennessee to put in elephants. But my friend in, in Nashville said, we're going to find a place where elephants can roam, that it isn't a zoo, you can't go and stand at the fence and give them peanuts. They're free and, and you can observe them, but it isn't a zoo. It's a place for them to roam. The Elephant Sanctuary covers some 2,700 acres and opened in 1995 to care for elephants retired from zoos and circuses. The sanctuary's Elicam allows viewers to watch the elephants via live stream without intruding into their habitat. It'd be like you're peeking and seeing what's going on in a forest. It's beautiful green grass and beautiful trees, but you don't see them all together. They don't line up. You don't stand there and feed them peanuts. You're viewing their privacy, I think. And when I was in Africa, I found it very interesting. They say elephants remember everything. And we were riding someone going through and there'd be a pile of bones. And the elephants would stop and touch every bone. They're relatives, I guess. They have that memory we don't quite understand. And they're so huge. And a gentle giant, I guess, is what you would say. Don may see these majestic beasts as gentle giants. But even at a well-run facility like the Elephant Sanctuary, Accidents can happen, and these seemingly placid animals can be unpredictable. The sanctuary mourned a volunteer killed by an elephant there in 2006. While Dawn loves all animals, it's with elephants that she feels there's space for a special bond between human and animal. Being in Africa and seeing them wander and roam by themselves, and they are such gentle giants. I know I was riding one, and the guide said to me, don't go up to him now. You're going to ride him for a while, but when we stop for lunch, then he will want to touch you. And the, and the elephant with his trunk touched me all over and looked me in the eye. But there was a relationship, and, and you, you, you see the size of that animal. I don't know what emotions they feel, but I think all animals relate to either each other or people or something. I think they're a blessing to this universe. Many of the elephants at the Elephant Sanctuary suffer long-term health and behavioral issues common to elephants that have spent their lives in captivity. Elephants are intelligent and social animals, and they have physical and social needs that cannot be met in captivity. 
It's simple as that. How far do you go and say, okay, let's buy a zebra. No, let's buy an elephant. Let's buy a cocker spaniel. What is the need from humanity to have to have that? I love to communicate with animals. I do, but, but respect me. I can live in my house. Respect you, you can live in your jungle. While Don's feelings on keeping elephants as pets are very clear cut, the issue of whether or not wild animals should be kept in zoos for education purposes has her torn. I don't think they should be pets. I think they should be left where they are, where they belong with each other, roam free. I mean, I've climbed the mountains in Rwanda. I've been as close as I am to you with the gorillas. I've watched the mountain gorillas bounce their babies on their knees and rock the babies and burp the babies just like we do. And no fear, because there aren't hunters and you're visiting their sanctuary in the middle of the mountains and don't want to disturb them. It's respect. I think it's respect for any wildlife. You can study it and you can read it, but to have that connection personally, that's rare. So do we put them in a zoo so we can say, I'm experiencing it? No, you're experiencing a little bit of it. You see them, you know, taking the bugs out of the baby's hair and rocking them and all that, but they're still in a cage. It's a conundrum, it really is, because how else would we know? We all can't go sit in the Rwanda mountains and wait till they come by. And yet, they should be free. I don't have an answer. She does, however, recognize the need for sanctuaries to care for exotic animals already in captivity. It's a controversy, I think. I mean, I think they are being taken care of and maybe they would be shot or maybe they would be hunted or maybe they would be starving where they came from. How they got there, I don't know. It's like if I have, if I have a dog, I'd like a backyard where he can roam. I don't want to have a dog sitting on a pillow in my house all the time. When I was doing Gilligan's Island, I had this pet sparrow that fell out of a tree and I couldn't feed the little baby. And I'd bring it, I'd bring it on the set in a shoebox, and all the crew would come in with little tweezers and little bugs and they'd feed him a little sparrow all day long. And at one point we let it go. But we nursed it back to health, so to speak. So I think hum, human beings can be an advantage to an animal. We have them in captivity and you see what they're doing. You, you are aware of their needs. But do you take them out of the jungle to do that? Or are they out of the jungle already? I think Hohenwald, they have plenty of space to roam but how many places can you have to do that? The elephant sanctuary is currently home to 11 elephants. Just give them the place to roam and, and the lack of human contact, I think, and where they should be with each other. I mean, when a new one comes in, they all welcome it. When they've lost one, they all mourn. You're really able to communicate the feelings that they're feeling. And when you're in the middle of the jungle in Africa, you don't know that's going on, you don't see that. They take care of them like they're a pet, but they're not a pet. They're cared for, and they're respected. Elephants at the Elephant Sanctuary enjoy large natural habitat enclosures, the companionship of a herd, and the benefits of using modern technology to learn about how best to care for them. To Don, this seems like the perfect solution, educating people about elephants, and at the same time, allowing them the freedom to Rome. I guess with the new modern way of doing things, the camera is on the elephant itself. And, and you are seeing what the elephant is seeing without being there and bothering them at all. And you're studying that animal, that animal's habitat and how they behave. That's new because of our technology. That's the way to do it, wouldn't you think? They're relatively small, relatively docile, and yet they're one of the most feared creatures on the planet. In many households, Alex Bardo's unusual pets would receive some pretty rough treatment. I often get people saying, like, uh, if your spider come near me, I'll, I'll do this and I'll do that, you know? And I, have to, I like to wonder what I, like, if, if I said that about their cat or their dog, how would they respond, you know? <laughs> people often uh, uh, question my mental, mental capability just for, uh, just for owning spiders and whatnot. <laughs> Alex has been collecting and selling a variety of invertebrates for about 18 months. His collection would cause as many as one in three women and one in four men to be crippled by fear. Some people would be like, ah, and, and like freak out. Others would, uh, would uh, just, uh, their fascination would be triggered and they'd walk up and ask about them, you know? Yeah, I guess I'm one of the people to ask about them. <laughs> How you feeling today, baby girl? Are you all mad? At Ken Fuse's Exotic Pets in Las Vegas, Gaz is also a fan of tarantulas as pets. They just 
such cool animals, you know, it's just they're, you know, they're, I've always found them fascinating. Um, from from the, the tiniest of little, like, common house spiders, you know, they're just fascinating, you know, and they, you know, they keep pest control down, you know, they eat all the little bugs and stuff like that, but, but they're just fascinating. I mean, look how beautiful that is. I mean, you know, check out all that reds and that, you know, it's just beautiful. They're just fascinating animals. Everybody knows that uh, they're not like dogs or cats. They don't need, uh, need affection or any love or communication at all. I think that's what I like about them. They're, they're like nothing else in the world. I guess they're uh, ornamental, primarily. Besides that, though, there is a, a bit of an edge factor of, uh, you know, do you want to see my tarantulas? Everybody's like, oh, yeah, you know. It makes for, um, makes for a good story. It actually started by uh, watching some dumb YouTube videos and uh, just uh, picking up some of my own tarantulas. I actually, uh, I just figured out that there were so many people doing it over east uh, that uh, the, uh, the animals over there have become so common. And uh, there's nobody collecting over in the west, so I thought there might be a market for it, so uh, I got more into it, you know? I would say they're pets primarily, yeah. I have my personal uh, collection that I'll never ever sell, and uh, ones that I'll, uh, I'll uh, you know, share around. Australia has very strict laws regarding the keeping of exotic animals, and many people aren't aware that native tarantulas can be kept as pets. I think a lot of people over here don't know that they actually are even native to Australia or even able to be kept. Um, one of the most common questions I get is, um, you know, like, uh, do, we, do we need a license to own these? I even get, uh, have they had their immunity jabs and stuff like this? <laughs> but no, they don't need that. <laughs> Australia has a reputation for its dangerous spiders, but surprisingly, tarantulas aren't among them. While their bite may be painful, it's very rarely fatal. I got bitten by my rose hair, and um, like I said, it was like, and I was probably around about 13, 14 years old, and it got me, um, and it was very shocking. You know, I was kind of like frozen with shock. So a lot of people's reaction is to, whoa, flinch, you know, and you can drop the tarantula, you can kill the tarantula that way. But I was just kind of like frozen in shock being 13, 14 years old, getting bitten by a tarantula the first time. Um, so I didn't really feel the pain or the sting till about maybe 10 minutes after. And, and then it, you know, it started stinging. I had, you know, you know, slight swelling where it had bitten me. But after about 20, 30 minutes, it went away. So that's how I knew I wasn't allergic to those kind of things. <laughs> you know, which is probably a good thing because, you know, people get stung by bees and they have allergic reactions. It's, it's, you know, it can be deadly. There is a chance for anaphylaxis with any kind of bite, with any kind of venom. There's been zero recorded deaths from tarantulas in, in throughout history. Uh, so you could even argue that uh, snails or anything is uh, more dangerous. There are two types of tarantula, old world species from the eastern hemisphere and new world species from the western hemisphere. In Australia, all we get is old world species and they're 160 million years old predators. They operate completely off instinct and they haven't been watered down through breeding to be uh, you know, prettier or uh, slower, less venomous and stuff like that. But the new worlds, they've been, uh, the color's been brought out in them and the placid, um, the placid behavior and whatnot. The new worlds are um, much more prone to being handled. Uh, in fact, most tarantulas will keep yeah, will tell you not to old, handle an old world at all. Yeah, yeah, they're very quick, very, uh, very fast, <laughs> unpredictable. Yeah. Tarantulas in the wild are nighttime hunters, pouncing on insects, beetles, and grasshoppers. The goliath bird-eating tarantula species of South America will eat larger prey, such as lizards, snakes, small birds, and mice. For a mouse, like, you know, it's, it's venom's powerful. Um, but like I said, for someone like us, like a healthy adult, you know, that's not allergic to those kind of things, it's, like I said, it's just like a bee sting. But for something that small, it's quite powerful. And plus, their fangs are pretty big, you know, so, that, you know, it can cause mechanical damage as well, you know. If it gets a certain animal in the right place, you know, it's going into its heart, it's going into its lungs, it's going to kill it a lot quicker, you know. So I think most of the time, you know, the damage is caused by the, you know, the, the size of the fangs, you know. They, they bite into a mouse with those size of the fangs and, you know, it's like getting stabbed in the heart or something like that, you know, it's, it's going to cause that mechanical damage. So the venom's not really going to kill it, but the mechanical damage is going to kill it. All the hairs that cover their body, they can feel like the slightest vibrations of like prey, you know, they can tell exactly what kind of prey it is as well by the way it moves on the ground and, you know, they feel the different vibrations through your sensitive hairs on their legs. Very strong, very powerful. And as like, like I said, the first time I got bit by a tarantula, I couldn't believe how strong it was, you know? The way they can grip you with their legs and pull, pull you in, it, I was just like, wow, you know? And that was just a rose hair. 
<laughs> you know, Rose has a pretty small tranche compared to these, so these guys are really powerful. Alex's pet powerhouses are fed on cockroaches and mealworms that he breeds himself. For spiderlings, I, I feed every three days, and uh, for adults, I feed once a week or so. But uh, adults can go 18 months without eating, so you can go away on holiday and still come back and, and be fine, you know? Yeah, mostly they look after themselves and thrive on darkness and loneliness. Although adept hunters in the wild, Alex says that tarantulas are not aggressive creatures. Aggressive is actually the wrong word for it. Uh, defensive would be the word for it. But uh, this one right here, that's a sel uh, Selenotypus wallace. She's, uh, she's a more calm one, but the uh, Selenophilus cotsman, which I've got in the garage there, uh, that's uh, arguably the most defensive tarantula in the world, actually. Along with his tarantulas, Alex keeps other arachnids known for their fierce and painful defense. It depends on the species, I would say. I've got the uh, Eurodacus elongatus over here, and that is, um, I'd say, one of the most uh, calm species in the world, actually. But uh, something like the Eurodacus uh, yashonkai, I wouldn't even go near. She did give me a clip yesterday, see that? That's a threat pose. She's getting a bit stressed, I'm gonna put her away. So she gets too stressed while rabbit. Uh, well, when she uh, when she puts the babies out, she'll um, she'll uh, eat them. Go on, and go that way in your hole. Good girl. Scorpions are also nocturnal hunters, and they do something else in the dark that is very unique. All species glow under ultraviolet light. It might seem difficult to know which end of the scorpion to avoid. Pincers that are used to crush their prey, or the sting in the tail that delivers toxic venom. Well, some of them can be quite bad. Most of the ones that I own, the Eurodaca scorpions, uh, they're, they're not too bad, but um, they're only about as dangerous as a bee, just like a tarantula. But I know of one called the Lychas bachari, which is uh, native to all of Australia. That will give me uh, a fair bit of pain, put me in hospital for a few days. Small pincers means a strong venom, and uh, strong pincers means a weak venom. Like the tarantulas, these arachnids don't return affection the way the more traditional pets do. But Alex has seen that they are not unintelligent critters. I think all animals, no matter how uh, uh, small the brain and instinctual they are, uh, they can get used to certain behaviors. Like um, if, I, if I feed one scorpion only mealworms and then I go to a cockroach, then they'll recognize that it's a different food. and. Uh, Oh, we got Maggie here as well. That's my other animal. I'm pretty sure she's got a family somewhere nearby. She comes and gets some worms for herself, uh, goes and gives them to the babies, and then comes back for her own meal, you know? She usually comes back twice. Good girl. I do that whistle every time so she gets to know uh, part of my voice, you know? She eats too many of these. I end up having, having to buy more, you know? <laughs> All right, go and get out. You need to learn how to hunt again. <laughs> the Australian magpie is known for its intelligence and for its habit of fiercely defending its nest by swooping at unsuspecting passers-by. No, no, she's never swooped me. Uh, I don't think I've seen her in mating season, though. I'm not sure. I could be wrong. I do worry about this guy on my shoulder with her around there. The guy on Alex's shoulder isn't a predator, but it's definitely an unorthodox creature to keep for companionship. Its extraordinary body is designed to look like the leaves it feeds on. If threatened, it will arch its tail above its body towards the intruder, much like the scorpion. This is a spiny leaf insect. It's one of the stick insect family. And uh, these guys are native to, uh, I think this one's from Northern Queensland, but they might be, uh, might be all over Australia. They're not my expertise, these, uh, these guys. But uh, what's interesting about them is uh, this is a female right now. You can, you can see that by the smaller wings. Males have bigger wings. And uh, basically, the, uh, the female will always give birth throughout her life, but she'll only give birth to females uh, if, she, uh, if she doesn't mate with a male. And if she mates with a male, then it'll be 50% female, 50% male. Interesting, huh? The spiny leaf insect is obviously not Alex's most dangerous predator, but neither is Maggie, the tarantulas, or the scorpions. The giant centipede is found across Australia, and its venom is toxic, to both insects and mammals. These multi-legged creepers can reach up to 16 centimeters long and have even been known to feed on small snakes. I've been bitten by a centipede, but not by an adult. It was only a peedling. 
and uh, it, it couldn't get through the skin. It was that uh, it was that small. I was trying to dig around for it under the soil, so it was a bit irresponsible of me. He must have just like felt something and then just uh, had a bit of a tag. It was like a pinch. Alex got away lightly. The bite from the giant centipede causes severe pain that can last several days. I would say that aggressive is again the wrong word for it. Defensive is the proper word, but if I was going to use it for anything, it would be it would be centipedes. Centipedes, if they bite you, they'll they'll hurt for a much longer time than a tarantula or a scorpion. I've uh, I've kept uh, tarantulas and scorpions for 18 months, but centipedes I don't think I'll ever get used to. They're just so unpredictable and uh, they can use those pincers on their back and uh, grab grab my finger and then try and like uh, walk back up themselves and onto my finger. This is what I mean by unpredictable and just they freak me out a little bit. <laughs> Despite its name, the giant centipede has only 21 or 23 pairs of legs. The first pair of legs behind its head are modified claws which curve around the head and can deliver venom into its prey. Go on, have a munch. Good lad. This species is common across Australia, and while out searching for a different species, he discovered a new color form of this one, endemic to Western Australia. It's native to all of Australia, but this particular one had uh, blue and green legs, so we call it the Perth form locale. Like uh, the form is like uh, the color form, and the locale is usually like the location where it was collected from, and that's what we used to, uh, to identify them over here. For example, like uh, Australian tarantulas, they're mainly recognized as Selenocosmia crassipes by, uh, by science but uh, anything beyond that is just a trade name. So for example, uh, Selenotypus Wallace, this one here, uh, she's, uh, that's just a trade name. It's just uh, you know, uh, something to identify where it's from, the color form. We were looking for Cerisophonius grandulosus, and we just found uh, so many of these, uh, this Cormocephalus orantopies around. We ended up collecting about 15 and then trying to sex them, but uh, it's, it's a bit hard, that one, because uh, to sex a centipede, you have to either give it some carbon dioxide uh, until it's uh, until it's unconscious, and then squeeze out the sexual organs to be able to see it, or you can uh, you can drown them for north of half an hour to be able to to be able to see it. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be mating them anytime soon. Alex does breed some of his own tarantulas and scorpions. Others come from other licensed dealers. Regulations differ from state to state. It's legal, but uh, poaching is more common in, uh, in my industry than I ever would have thought previously. There's people that go to uh, people's property without permission from the owners, and there's people that don't have licenses to actually collect from the West. It's, it's unfortunate how it all happens, but um, the people in the scene, from the activists to the, uh, to the licensed collectors to the breeders, it's a pretty tight-knit community. So it's, uh, it's pretty easy for us to, um, to, uh, to track where the spiders go and, and where they come from, which ones are legal and whatnot. Alex is licensed to collect some specimens from the wild. Those that come from other breeders arrive in a somewhat surprising way. Like all of us, Alex enjoys the rush of having a parcel arrive in the mail. It's kind of got less exciting as time went on. This must be, this must be my like 500th tarantula or something like that. So it gets less exciting, of course. <laughs> There's a roach in that one as well. However, the local mailman is not nearly as fond of Alex's deliveries. He freaks out, and uh, it's, it always seems like he's in a rush to leave every time he comes over, you know? 